Then he asks the questions about work, the attitude of a worker to doing a good job, this interesting desire to hold on to the sense, I do good work, even knowing that the harder you work at doing good work, the more you're making profit for somebody who's not only other than you, but is going to use that process to screw you 12 different ways and your family as well. How do you, how do you work all that out? So it becomes... And that's why he's so powerful. It becomes the first, I mean, I'm giving him a little bit more than he deserves, but he deserves a lot. One of the early Marxists, Georg Lukács, a Hungarian, was another one, but one of the early ones who really began the interest in Marxists to go beyond economics and politics and look hard and with deep respect at how culture works, how ideology works, how religion works, to understand this, how the capitalists, the employers, who are in fact a small minority of the community, are able to be as powerful, to govern, because they can put together an alliance. They can go find other parts of society and work a deal with them so that this minority, through these connections, can become dominant, or in his language, become hegemonic, be able to control the society as a whole, even though they are a small and in and of themselves vulnerable minority until they have hooked in, for example, the religious community, perhaps, and the artistic community, and the skilled workers' sense of themselves. And the minute you see what Gramsci's trying to do for Italy, the ability to apply that to the United States today jumps at you. Right. So, and also, I would go so far as into, into looking at ourselves self-critically, like, in terms of how we replicate these things in our own communities and our own activities. And obviously, some of it is unavoidable. I'm not, you know, I'm not a, especially having grown up without any money, I'm not a hair shirt person. So I'm not talking about, you know, these like, oh, well, you should, you know, you shouldn't make a profit or make a living or any of this sort of thing. We live in the world as it is. But then conversely, when we're constantly even if we're discoursing a certain politics, but we don't treat each other with compassion or solidarity, or we don't try to at least somewhat model or prototype something different in our own you know, spaces, we could be replicating that same hegemony. Oh, yeah, I think if yeah. Gramsci were here today, for, I mean, I'll pick a provocative example. If Gramsci were here today, he would say something like this to us, say, about the last 50 years of the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO is a minority. It's the organized workers, the unionized workers. Uh, back in the 1940s, 50s, they had a third of the private sector work force in the unions. That's a minority, but a strong one. Mm -hmm. They needed to understand, they didn't, but they needed to understand that like the employers, a smaller minority, they had to build their own, using Gramsci's language now, counter hegemon. In other words, they had to struggle for hegemony. And, they, and to do that, they had to build alliances. Now, coming out of the Great Depression, they already had an alliance. They had an alliance with two socialist parties and a communist party. And all, and they were big in those days. And all of the people who were touched by all of that, which is a lot of people, they either could build on that coalition, which had been very successful in the 1930s, getting us little things, you know, social security, <laughs> unemployment compensation, a minimum wage, and a federal jobs program, which affected, you know, almost every family in the country one way or another. Right. So they had proven that they were powerful. They were proven that they could act politically. They could. They had proven that they could become close to hegemonic since every one of those things I just mentioned was opposed by the business community with fervor all through the 1930s, but they lost. And my argument is that's Gramsci's wisdom. Something was done to immobilize the risk of a counter-hegemony to better solidify the hegemony of the employers. How do we build counter-hegemony? Well, the first thing is to recognize the problem. It's like with everything else. The first right. step forward is to recognize that the labor movement, for example, if we were to start there, we don't have to, but if we were, has to have broad social allies. If there's a feminist movement, 
rush towards it to build an alliance. If there's an anti-racist movement, do it there. If there's a movement for gay liberation, whatever, wherever. Well, I'm going to tell you about Antonio Gramsci, the great Italian communist. When he was incarcerated in Mussolini's dungeon from 1928 to 1937 for the crime of thinking, I mean, what was Gramsci? Gramsci was a newspaper guy. He wrote these wonderful analysis about how political hegemony and culture relate to class struggle and all that stuff. And we still read his stuff. We're not a Mussolini. Well, Mussolini's bones are rotting in the grave and we can spit on his grave. People are still reading Gramsci. So we know which one of them was the real immortal. Not the one who strut around and pronounced himself the immortal, but the guy who sat there and he wrote. And Gramsci was in Mussolini's dungeon for the crime of thinking and being concerned about the well-being of the people of his country. And that's why he went to prison. And that's why so many people from El Salvador to, to Guatemala, to Indonesia, to Zaire are in prison today for thinking and being concerned about the welfare of their people. That's why people in prison here, Geronimo Pratt and Leonard Peltier and others, in prison because they're concerned about the welfare of their people. Um, so Gramsci's in prison. And the only thing that keeps him alive is they allow him to have a few notebooks. And he writes in notebooks with a pencil. His prison notebooks, which are published, which I presume Black Oak has copies of. They better. And if they don't, they will tomorrow. <laughs> but he had to be very careful to eliminate words or phrases. He had to eliminate phrases like Marx, and Marxist, and capitalism, and class. Those words would attract the attention of the fascist censors. The fascists knew why they were in power. They knew what their job was. It was to make the world safe from anybody who was critical of capitalism and corporate multi, multinational corporate capitalism, to make the world safe for the haves against the have-nots. And if the fascists found those words in the books, the censor, they would take away his notebooks and his pencils and he would not be able to do any more writing. So he had to write those coded phrases. The fascists understood their job was to suppress class consciousness, anti-class consciousness, wherever it might appear. So I'll read this next paragraph. It goes as follows. Today, most of our intellectuals, journalists, and social commentators avoid the use of the word class as carefully as did Gramsci. Unlike him, they are not in prison. <laughs> okay, he's got some Gramsci books out there for those who for those who will later hear of this on radio. I think I'm gonna have to start from the top again. I mean, <laughs> no. Unlike him, we're talking about the intellectual journalists of our day, they avoid the use of the word class as carefully as did Gramsci. <laughs> Unlike him, they are not in prison and there's no need for rulers to put them there. Throughout their schooling and professional training, they are censored by superiors and more generally by the monopoly culture in which they live. Soon they learn to censor themselves. And by soon after all, become so automatic and ingrained that it's not experienced with any kind of censorship. They still occasionally use words like Marxism and Marxist but it is usually in a dismissive, negative labeling way. They don't need a fascist censor breathing down their necks because they have a mainstream one implanted in their heads. These internalized forms of suppression are far more effective in preserving the dominant ideology than any state censor could hope to be. Gramsci knew he was being censored. Many of our intellectuals and pundits think they are f as free as birds, and they are as long as they fly around in the right circles. The thing about Gramsci, the gift he gives, which is where you're going with this, and I think you're quite right to do it, is that Gramsci was always agonized over the following thing. His first introduction into big-time politics was a massive general strike that took place in the Italian city of Turin, Torino in Italian, which was the home then, as it still is, of the Fiat Automobile Company. And he led, that's how he became kind of a big leader, he led 
a strike, a massively successful strike for a long time. In the end, it wasn't so successful. But for a long time, they led the workers out in Torito. And out of that experience and in the immediate years thereafter, he reached the following crisis, if you might say it. His observation was the workers are really badly treated. They know they're badly treated. They know who's badly treating them. It isn't a mystery. Or to use his language, the objective situation is ripe for a revolution, for the majority to rise up and stop the exploitation that is their daily life. But they're not doing it. And we can't get them to do it. Why is that? Why is it that the objective circumstance is clear, is decisive, and gives us the chance to win? But the subjective, that's how he reasoned it, the way people think is blocking them from seeing and doing what they're able to do. They could win tomorrow.